Hi there, this is Sharon Cluck with Mind the Messiah Ministries of Farmington, Missouri. I will remind you to please like and share and subscribe. And we thank you for all of you that listen in and share with us. We've been doing a study and we did miss last week because we were traveling again, but we're back this week and we're picking up on seeking the truth related the, to the rapture. And so we looked at the very first week, we looked at Matthew 24 and we were going to continue there on the second week. We really didn't get back to it. We had a lot of other scriptures to consider. I've also added some extra scriptures in today. We are going to go back to Matthew 24, Lord willing, unless he changes things in the middle of this. And we're going to take a, a look at um, not all of it, but another 10 or so verses out of Matthew 24. On the board, I have the scriptures that we're going to cover today. We're going to be in Matthew 24, 14 through 24. That's 10. We'll be in Job 2, 32. Galatians 1, 7, and Revelations 14, 1 through 13, and in Daniel 9 and Daniel 11. So we had a little interruption, but we're back. And we're going to start today, Matthew 24. If you remember, when we started looking at this, we started out with Matthew 24, and we looked at verse 3, because there was a big question there from the disciples. They were looking at the buildings that, that Herod had built, and Jesus said, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. And so the disciples asked him this question, what is the sign of your coming and the end of the world? They connected those two things together. What is the sign of your coming and the end of the world? That was Matthew 24, 3. So we went on down through the first 13 verses in that very first lesson. So today we're going to pick up at verse 14 of Matthew 24. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for our witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So when I looked at that, that immediately took my mind to another scripture that I had looked at previously. The gospel of the kingdom is the message of Yahweh's rule. That's what the gospel of the kingdom is. There are right now two kingdoms on this earth. You have the kingdom of Satan, which is a system of this world, what it's operating under right now. That's why they call him the prince of the power of the air and why they say that he's the god of this world, because he is ruling the systems of this world. We have to remember that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and everything that's in it. He created every one of us and everything that's in it. So he has ownership of this world, but it is being ruled by the ruler of darkness. So you have two kingdoms operating all the time. So this gospel of the kingdom or the kingdom of God shall be preached to all of the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. Well, I've had people say numerous times, well, how do we know when the gospel is preached to every creature. How will we know when that happens? Well, there are scriptures that allow us to have a better understanding of that. So the gospel of the kingdom is the message of Yahweh's rule of his kingdom and all that it stands for. To be preached is to be heralded, to be published and proclaimed the divine truth. It would be proclaimed to the entire globe is what the scriptures say. The end will then come when it is preached to the entire globe. So that is the final conclusion will be present or it will have arrived. We will come to the telos, the end of things when that gospel is preached to the whole world. So this is a scripture that is referring to that. It's about being published to the whole world. So we're going to look for a minute over at Revelations 14. And because I want to keep it in context, I want to start with verse one. I'm going to emphasize verse six, because that's where it talks about the gospel of the kingdom being preached. Revelations 14, verse one is where we're going. And we're going to read down through 13. 
Now, there's a whole lot of stuff in this passage of scripture, and a lot of it's difficult for us to understand. First of all, it's speaking about the 144,000. Well, there's so many ideas and doctrines about who that 144,000 is that nobody can say for sure. We do know that there are 12,000 out of every tribe of the Jewish nation, out of the Hebrews. And our point here is going to be verse six, but we're going to read from one. So I'm going to begin with one. And then I looked, and this is what I saw. The lamb, we all know who the lamb is. He stood firmly established. This is out of the Amplified. He stood, stir, he, he stood firmly established on Mount Zion. We all know that Mount Zion is in the earth. He is standing on Mount Zion in the earth. And with him are 144,000 who had his name, the name of the father, his name inscribed on their forehead, <coughs> signifying that they are gods. They belong to God. <coughs> the lamb, which is Yeshua, is standing on Mount Zion. He has with him 144,000 people that are sealed, who have been marked with his name. And it means that he has ownership of these people. He, his name is what's on those people, and it's stamped in their forehead. In Joel 2, 32, it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, so Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. Let's get straight where we are. Jesus is standing on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and he has 144,000 people with him that have been sealed. The Lord said, so this is still out of Joel. Um, let me start again. It says, um, and it shall come to pass who shall ever call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. That's where the deliverance is coming from, where Yeshua is. As the Lord has said, and in the remnant who the Lord shall call. So if he's talking about a remnant that the Lord shall call and he is in Mount Zion, these 144,000 must be part of the remnant. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that, am I making a doctrine? Does that make sense? It's in print, it's in scripture. Okay. So in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem and in the remnant, there is deliverance. So it looks like the deliverance is found in Yeshua and in those who have been sealed with his name and that they are become one with him and they also are bringing deliverance. Or it could mean that deliverance is there and so are those who have been marked. Either way, Yeshua is deliverance. He's in Jerusalem with his feet on the mount. Then in Revelations 14, 2, we'll go back there. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of great waters and like the rumble of mighty thunder. And the voice that I heard seemed like music. And it was like the sound of the harvest playing on their harps. So Yeshua is in Mount Zion, but the music is coming from heaven. Kind of hard to get these pictures sometimes sung a new song before the throne of God and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased, ransomed, and redeemed from the earth. So they are purchased from the earth. Revelation 7, 4 says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 140 of 4,000, all the tribes of the children of Israel. So we know from that, that all the tribes of Israel. So 10 of those tribes are lost tribes. Jesus knows exactly where those tribes are. And out of them, he chooses 12,000 out of each tribe. But then you have to remember there's two sons of Joseph. So there were actually 13 tribes. 
So how do we figure that one out? Well, the speculation is that somehow Dan is left out. In this list of those that are from the 144,000 is Manasseh, who is the son of Joseph, and also Joseph is named. Dan's name is not in that list. Why is that? Well, if you know, tell me, because I don't. Revelations 14.4. 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled by relations with women, for they are celibate. They are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased and redeemed from around men of Israel as the first fruits, sanctified and set apart for special service for God and the Lamb. In Mark 8, 34, it says, And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So he's telling us who he's chosen. He calls them and he says to them, whoever will come after me, let him deny himself. Well, he's just told us that these people are celibate. This doesn't necessarily mean that these are men that have never been with a woman. It means that there's, these are people who have never served any other God, that they have dedicated themselves to God fully with their whole heart, and they've never served another God. They are fully committed to Yeshua as their husband. We talked about this last week. What is it like to be a follower? One who will lay down his life for the kingdom. So I know this is not taught to us as Christians. We're told that everything has been done for us that the gift of salvation is free and that it costs us nothing. So I'm asking you, is this the truth of what the scripture teaches? Asking you a question, you get to give the answer. I'm not telling you what to believe. Does the scripture teach us it cost us nothing? What does it really mean to be a follower of Jesus? You get to answer the question. Every one of the disciples felt that to follow Jesus meant that they would die for their faith. What could this mean for you? What will you do if you are ever faced with the same choices that they were faced with? I'm just asking questions. Revelations 14, 5. No lie was found in their mouth, for they are blameless spotless, untainted, they are beyond reproach. Wow, I don't think I ever met anybody like that. We live in a day and a time that we tell lies without even flinching. There's no conscience guiding our morality. We are told that these are just little white lies. They don't hurt anything. They don't hurt anyone. That it's that, what we say when it says it doesn't hurt anyone, that there is a lie. That in itself is a lie. When we answer the phone and we say, no, he's not here, when he really is. When we make excuses to not hurt somebody's feelings, like you don't want to be with that person, so you tell them you got a meeting to go to or somewhere else to go. We lie. We're society that does not know how to speak the truth. And these that are on the mountain with Jesus, they're beyond reproach. I can only wish that I could be there. So here's where I want to go when we flipped over here to Revelations. Revelations 14, 6. And then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with the eternal gospel to preach to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation and tribe, and language, and people. The eternal gospel will be preached to every tribe, tongue, nation, and people of the world, even if it has to be preached by an angel. In Galatians 1.6, Paul says this, 
I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into grace of Christ unto another gospel. We have another gospel that we've been taught in this country. It's not the gospel that's taught in the scriptures, which is not another, but to some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's the same gospel, it's just been perverted. It's been twisted. And it's difficult to recognize what does it require of us because we weren't taught what it was required. The gospel has been perverted. We're taught about a Jesus who did away with the laws of God, who changed the Sabbath day, who gives us a free ride, who demands no loyalty. Holiness, what is that? He holds us to that. He says, if you wanna follow me, you have to pick up your cross and do what I did. Well, what did he do? More questions. He laid down his life for the kingdom, for you. What does he require of you? What does it mean to take up your stake? What does that mean to you? I'm just asking more questions. Everyone will hear the gospel even if it has to be preached by a flying angel. And it says that when that happens, then the end will come. So when we look at this, what's going on at this time? Jesus is in Jerusalem with his feet firmly planted on Mount Zion with 144,000. Music is coming from heaven. 144,000 are singing this song that nobody else knows, and they're there with Jesus. And then an angel starts flying, preaching the everlasting gospel. We're told the end comes when the everlasting gospel is preached to every kingdom, nation, people, and tongue. And we see that happening at the end when Jesus is in Jerusalem with 144,000. So if we're looking for a time frame here, we can look at some key things that are happening all at the same time to try to put together what will happen. He, I mean, he's got this all clumped together in these scriptures, John does in the book of Revelation. So look, let's look a little further. In verse seven, and he said with a loud voice, fear God. This is what the angel who's preaching the everlasting gospel says. He has a really loud voice, no trouble hearing him. Fear God with awe and reverence and give him glory and honor and praise in worship because the hour of his judgment is come. What time is it? Judgment. with all of your heart worship him how are we supposed to do this with all of our heart worship him who created the heavens and the earth the sea and the springs of water with all of your heart the word fear god is to literally be frightened alarmed be in awe and to revere be sore afraid to fear exceedingly. That's G5399. Now, here is another word people don't like. They don't like the word Torah. They don't work like the word law. They don't like the word holiness. And they don't like the word fear. I've had people say to me, I have never feared God in my life. Nothing to be afraid of. Doesn't that mean to revere him? You know what? I really think that if we were not filled with the love and the power by the blood of Jesus, that we would be terrified and trembling at his presence. What will those who don't have Jesus be doing? 
hiding in the rocks, praying for them to fall on them. I'd say that's fear. They're afraid of the wrath of God. Verse 8 of Revelation 14. And then another angel, a second one followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her immorality, corrupting them with idolatry. Babylon is this satanic system of this earth. Everybody wants to name who and what Babylon is. Is it Iraq where Babylon was once before? Is it the United States of America? Is she Babylon? We always wanna point a finger to a place. I'm thinking, again, you have to ask these questions to yourself, <laughs> that Babylon is the kingdom that rules this age. I'm not so sure that we can pinpoint a place or a location. It is the entire kingdom of Satan, the rule of this world, just like they wanted to overthrow God as the Tower of Babel. Well, this system has continued to this day. The same desire to overthrow God at the Tower of Babel is the same system that's operating right now throughout the entire world that desires to live forever without God, to replace God. Satan wanted to be God. He used fallen angels and mankind to promote his agenda. Verse nine, and then another angel, this is the third one, followed them saying with a loud voice, whoever worships the beast, and his image and receives the mark of the beast on his forehead are in his hand. So these are the places that we're warned about. It's not like a brand on your fanny like they would a cow. It's an obvious place. It's on your forehead or on your hand. Verse 10, he too will have to drink the wine of the wrath of God mixed undiluted into the cup of his anger. So God's not just serving up wrath. He's serving up wrath in a cup of anger. It reminds me, I shared with this group a while ago that we had some uh, crows, big birds that attacked the house. And I became very angry and I went out and I just very angrily told them to leave. So when in the name of Jesus and by his blood, and they left. What we look at here is that the wrath that God is serving up is mixed in a cup of anger. So this is a cup that's been reserved that we, he will pour his wrath into, and that will be then poured out on the enemies or on Babylon. And he will torment them with fire and brimstone flaming sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb, our Messiah. Verse 11 of 14. And the smoke of their torment is sins forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. For those who desire to take the mark of the beast, this is what is written. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12. Here is encouragement for the steadfast endurance of the saints. God's people. So somehow, this is supposed to help you be enduring. Somehow, knowing that judgment is coming and knowing that ultimately you will have rest, because we're going to read that in the next verse. But he's saying here, now listen to this. Here is the encouragement of the steadfast endurance of the saints of God, God's people. Those who habitually keep God's commandments 
and their faith in Jesus Christ. How long do you have to keep it? Forever. Habitually. It is a habit. It is a way of life. It's how you live. And you can read this in the Amplified, and they have taken this out so you will understand it more clearly. This is what it's talking about. You don't keep the commandments of God just when you get a whim to keep them and decide it's okay to lie and cheat and steal any other time. You habitually, as a habit, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Who does it say the saints are? Those that are habitually keeping his commandments. But I'm not sure that most Christians know what God's commandments are. Even the one that says, to not bear false witness. We just got done talking about how easily we tell a lie and think nothing of it. Oh, that's nothing. I just didn't want to hurt their feelings. We need to learn to tell the truth and still not hurt people's feelings. However, God teaches us to do that. If we learn to start doing it, we will habitually do it in a manner that we can still be loving and kind. And I heard the distinct words of a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed. So this is why you are encouraged. Listen to this one. Blessed, happy, prosperous, and to be admired are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, blessed indeed, says the spirit, so that they may rest and have relief from their labor for their deeds do follow them. This is what I keep in mind when I hear about God's people going home early. I make a point in my heart as much as I miss them to rejoice on their behalf. They're finished. They could finally get some R&R. &R. I remember when the guys were in Vietnam, they couldn't wait for that time of R&R &R where they could just go, they would go to Hawaii or wherever else they got to go and, and just take a month and relax in the middle of their tour. Rest and relaxation. So now we're going back over to Matthew 24, where he talks about the abomination of desolation. Okay, we're back at Matthew 24. Verse 15 is where we came to. So when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Jesus is preaching out of the prophets. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. So Jesus is giving key happenings for us to know that great danger is at hand. The disciples said to him, how will we know the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? <laughs> Jesus said, gives them the key happenings, when you see the abomination of desolation, which the prophet Daniel spoke about. He's quoting the prophet Daniel, who's speaking of the one who makes things desolate. So there will be someone who makes desolation, destruction. He brings destruction. So Daniel 9, 27 says this, and he shall confirm the covenant with many. Let's talk about with what many means. It means he shall confirm, means that he will make something strong or something to prevail. He will act insolently. Um, he will prevail he will put to more strength. So the covenant, he is adding to some kind of covenant, some kind of agreement. We know from the Torah that when Abraham cuts covenant or the uh, Middle Eastern people cut covenant, that they cut animals in half and that they walk through those animals. And what that means is that if you break this covenant, what's happened to these animals will happen to you. Each person that makes the covenant walks through the animals to make an agreement that they are willing to give their life to make sure these things happen. We see 
in our country and in our world today, we don't see covenants, we see contracts. And contracts are broken just like that. And people think nothing of it. But it says that this person or entity, whoever this is, will make some kind of an agreement and he's going to make it even stronger than what it had been previously. And with many means by contraction, it is H 7231. And it means, with many, it means people of rank or quality um, in abundance. So there'll be an abundant group of, or there'll be many people involved in this covenant. They will be like captains or elders. It will be a multitude. They'll be officers is what that, when it says with many, that translates officers. Plenteous, a populace or a prince, someone of authority is going to make this covenant with this person who will ultimately desolate things and they will do it on behalf of many people. So many people will be represented by the one who has agreed to this covenant. Consummation is complete destruction that he has determined to pour out upon the temple. So let me read that full verse now that we talked about what those words mean. Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. A sacrifice and an oblation has been set up. Now it will cease. And for the offspreading or overspreading of abominations, so he's going to cover it with abominations, he shall make it desolate. He's going to bring destruction, desolation, even until the consummation or until that is complete, it's going to completely destroy. And the determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. So he is determined to do something that will bring destruction. Then in Daniel 11, verse 31, and arms, strength and power shall stand on his part going to be established and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. The sanctuary of strength is the holy of holies. This is the holy of holies, what they will pollute. And shall take away the daily sacrifice. So there will be a daily sacrifice established that will be taken away. He will forbid the daily sacrifice to be made and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate and abomination means something disgusting, filthy, idolatrous, a detestable thing. The word desolate is to stun, to devastate, to stupefy, to make amazed or astounded, to destroy, to waste. And it's so astounding that it is a wonder. So let's try to put this in perspective again. In the beginning of the chapter of Matthew 24, Jesus says the temple will be destroyed. Just looking at the second temple, he says it will be destroyed. Not one stone will be upon another. And then he says that there will be someone who will do something so terrible to the temple that it will make everybody run for the hills. Well, he's not saying to say and fight. That's what the Maccabees did when Antichus Epiphany did the abomination desolation. They stayed and they fought, fought when he put the pig on the altar. Instead, this is so terrible that they're told to run. So he's sitting on the mountain looking at the temple. He's telling the disciples that it will be destroyed and that not one stone will be upon another. But then he tells them about an event in the temple that we can look back and see did not happen at the time that the second temple was destroyed. It didn't happen to the second temple. 
So Jesus must be speaking of a different temple. This has to be an obvious event. Jesus is telling him it's a sign. I've wondered if the temple, that there was really no need for a third temple. I wondered that. But if Satan is trying to set up an altar of himself within us, but if that's true, it would not be as obvious as a literal third temple, something so obvious that it would make people run for their lives. If it's so subtle that he is destroying the, the altar within our temple, it would not be obvious enough to make people run for the hills. This is an obvious sign. They asked for a sign for the end of the age and, and his return. And he's telling them, when this happens, run, run, flee. Mark 24, 16. And then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So this is happening in Israel. This event he's describing will happen in Israel. Verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. We talked about this in previous studies, how Israel's housetops were set up. That was where they went up to do all kinds of things. They did meditation. They, they actually had parties up there. They had ladders that would go down the outside. You did not have to go back into the inside of the house. You didn't go into the inside of the house to get out of the house. You could get off the roof from outside. Verse 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them who have given suck in those days. I'm wondering if this part of the, um, is this part of the anti-population agenda? Would it be dangerous for a woman to actually be pregnant or to have had a child? If they're trying to stop the population of children. Would a person who actually got pregnant be in danger of their life? Again, a question. There, we have laws in California that they have subjected to that <laughs> if a child dies in the first year from abuse of some kind, well, it, it, that it's not chargeable because it's still not a person as far as they're concerned. So if we think that crazy here in the United States? What is it worldwide? I mean, they, they have all these um, uh, rainbow flags right now with the Star David on them. They're being displayed all over the place. Matthew 24, 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. What do you just tell them to do? and to pray, to pray. So he's talking to people who pray. What kind of people would pray? Those who love him, his people. Believers that he would answer prayer. Yeah. So they are here at this time that he's telling them they're gonna to have to flee. These are people who pray. So they're his people. Pray that your flight not be in winter and neither on the Sabbath day. And he's speaking about people fleeing that are praying people. And he tells them how to pray. He's giving them instructions on how to pray at a time. I think I'd be doing that now. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation. What did I just say? Then there shall be great tribulation. There are people here that are being told how to pray during the time that there's great tribulation. Is that where the you will suffer a little while to come in? I can't tell you. These are questions for you to answer. So, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. Then there shall be great tribulation. He's talking to people who pray, telling them how to pray, 
telling them to flee, saying there will be a great tribulation. This is it. This is the decide. This is the sign the disciples were asking about. Matthew 24, 22. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. No one. No one. There may be entities that are not flesh. There may be entities that are AI. But if it's not shortened, there will be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. For whose sake? What are the elect doing here during the Great Tribulation? What are they doing here? For you to answer. No flesh will be saved. The plan is for everyone to die. So God will shorten the days to ensure that there shall be someone left to save. And those that he saves will be called the very elect. So let's look at what that means. No flesh is an absolute negative. No flesh means no human being. The elect is G1588. It means select, favorite, chosen. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So the ones that he chose are here doing verse 21, great tribulation. They're supposed to be fleeing. And if the days are not shortened, that even his very favorite people would not be spared. And so he will sharpen it for their sake. So if you are God's very favorite and you're his very elect, and there is a pre-tribulation rapture, why are you still here? Wouldn't he take his yeah. favorite ones home first? Just asking some questions. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I chose you. I have appointed and I have placed and I have purposely planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing and that your fruit would remain and be lasting so that whenever you ask the father in my name as my representatives, that's who we are, his representatives, he may give it to you. And then Matthew 24, 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, are there. Believe it not. Believe it not. Doesn't matter who says this to you, do not believe it. And that's when there will be many false Christ, a false prophet. They will do signs, don't believe what you see. And that's why there is so much deception. If the believers are already out of here, from a pre-tribulation rapture, why would anyone be looking to find Christ? Why would we be looking to find Christ? Why would it behoove anybody to say, well, Christ is over here, Christ is over there. We're already gone. We wouldn't be looking for Christ. He is the anointed one. So Jesus is speaking to believers. A false prophet is a pretender, foreteller, our religious imposter. Then the last verse we're going to look at today is Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. The very elect. Yeah if it were possible. So there will be attempts to deceive the very last one who is here serving God. The one that has to flee, the one that has to pray, the one that, that he says, now there's great tribulation. 
but the elector's still here. He's telling us how to pray. And he says, when they say I'm over here, I'm over there, don't believe it because you're gonna wanna find out where he is. If you're one of his, you're gonna go look. Again, what are these people doing here? There's supposed to be a pre-tribulation rapture. They're here to save the ones that are not saved yet. We have an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. Don't you think that if there's a pre-trib rapture, that the very elect would have gone at that time. For some reason, he has it here. What are the very elect doing here while the Antichrist is here? Or at least there's somebody doing abominable things in the temple and God's people are being told to flee. That's true. Well, that's good. So... Somebody just said, oh, that's good. I, I don't know that we really think that's good. No, I mean, <laughs> the way you did it today, this is good. But my point is, it would really be good if there was a pre-tribulation rapture, if I could find the scriptures that would enforce that the way these enforce that there isn't. We're going to keep looking. We're going to keep looking at some of them. There's a lot of... of um, Theology, there's a lot of doctrines that promote other viewpoints, and we will continue to look. But from what I'm seeing down to the 24th verse in Matthew, what I have seen in Revelations 14 and in Daniel, and when I see that there is a great tribulation, that there could be such deception that the very elect, the very chosen of God, could be deceived. When you're deceived, you would take the mark of the other kingdom. If you were deceived, you wouldn't have the mark of God if you were deceived. Well, that's why he wants to shorten the days because his very favorite people are here. Those that are left, the humans that are still here. He said there would be no flesh left. So again, lots of questions today. I'm not trying to answer them for you. You take them, you take the scriptures we looked at. If you think that I have twisted them or I've manipulated them or I made them say something they didn't say, I want you to please address that in the comment sections under this video. If you agree with the way that I've presented them, you can comment on that too. But either way, our whole point is that we're searching for the truth. There is in my heart an understanding a rapture because the angels gather us from the four corners of the earth and they take us to him. It tells us that, you know, one will be in the field and the other will be taken. And one, be, one will be sleeping and the other one will be taken. When is all that? How does that all happen? How does that all fit? So we're going to keep searching and we're going to keep looking and we're going to try to come to the truth. But more than anything, this is not about who's right or who's wrong about any of this. It's about being prepared for whatever comes. I want to be the very elect. I I would like to be one of the 144,000. I would like to be singing a song that nobody else gets to sing. I actually had somebody tell me that one time that the Lord told them that I was one of the 144,000. I laughed at him. <laughs> I just went, really? <laughs> and tell me that. Anyway, I can even tell you his name. I remember exactly who told me that. Anyhow, Let's take the scriptures, let's be Bereans, let's do our due diligence, continue to look, continue to listen, and let's see what the word of God is saying. We've got to take the whole of the word. We can't just take scriptures out of context and make them say things. That's why when I read to you, I read you 14 verses when I only need it one. I only need it chapter verse six that I needed out of that, but I'm reading to you a context because 
I don't want to pull things out of context. I want you to understand clearly what God is saying. So for those of you that join us later, please like, subscribe, share. We'd appreciate that. Join us again next week. We're going to keep digging together. Father, we praise you. And we thank you for your work. We thank you that you're not finished with us, that you want us to know the truth, that you're not hiding anything from us, that you want us to have understanding, that you want to just open up our minds and our hearts and pour yourself into us. Holy Spirit, over flood us, over uh, fill us with the power of your spirit, God. Give us wisdom and eyes to see and ears to hear and understanding to make this stuff live in our life. And more than anything, Father, make us be those five virgins that have oil in our lamp, that we get to go in, that the door is open to us, the door is not closed, that you don't ever say you didn't know us. God, we want to know you. We want to know you. And we want to know you in the power of your resurrection. We want to be followers. We want to be following your commandments, the commandments of Yahweh and keeping the testimony of Yeshua, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for eternal life. And that no matter what this is, that you will keep us. You said you had the ability to keep those you had chosen to the very end that you will keep us. You've chosen us and you will keep us. And we're counting on that, Father. We're counting that we're not deceived. We don't have to walk in fear. And Father, that you give us the power to fight back. You give us the strength and the understanding and, and the ability to stand strong against the wiles of the devil. I thank you, Father, that you're teaching us what some of those wiles are and how to fight this good fight. Father, cause us to be soldiers, fully armed, fully equipped, and approaching into the kingdom of heaven, establishing the kingdom of God on this earth. And Father, your word says in uh, Romans that all of creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God to appear. Let us, Father, be those sons of God. In the name of Yeshua, we bless you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.